Okay, a, a good afternoon. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to talk this afternoon about uh, character and wisdom. Uh, my name is Wouter Sandersen. Um, I am a associate professor at the Fontys University of Applied Sciences, uh, more in particular at the uh, College for Teacher Training. And I would appreciate it a lot if you could close the door because it's quite distracting, at least for me. Thank you. Um, well, um, I have stand for such an intelligent audience before, but I would like to stress your intelligence um, here a little bit because I would like to talk about the relationship between intelligence and wisdom and whether the university is preparing you to become wise or only to help you to become smart. So who is doing a bachelor's degree at the moment? Okay, about, let's say half, two thirds. Uh, who is pursuing a master's? And who is doing a PhD or already has one? Okay, well, as um, education level and intelligence are correlated, um, I think your average IQ must be about 120, 125. That's pretty, pretty high, I would say. But if I would ask you the question, who of you is wise? Who dares to raise his hand? No one. Who is foolish? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> and who is somewhat in between? <laughs> Okay, so this, I think this, is, this, also, this already points to an, an interesting aspect of at least uh, uh, psychological research into wisdom, that people who say they are wise uh, are often foolish. So the, the foolish people tend to uh, boast a bit and to say that more, they are more uh, wise, whereas those who are wise tend to be quite humble and uh, uh, will not boast about their wisdom that much. So actually when you, if you're not raising your hand when I ask you whether you're wise, you might actually be very wise. Uh, well, this is one of the paradoxes, I think, in um, wisdom research. Anyway, I'll just give a quick overview of what we will, will, what we will be doing uh, this afternoon. Um, First, I'd like to continue talking a bit about the relationship between and the differences between intelligence and wisdom. Then I'd like to look at two sources uh, that have a lot of interesting things to say about wisdom. Uh, philosophy, I'm a philosopher myself, uh, but also psychology. I think both have interesting things to say and should ideally uh, be combined in order to help us not only to know what is wise, but also to become it. Then I'd like to offer some advice about uh, how you can cultivate wisdom. And this is not a very um, easy thing to do, to become wise or to help others to become it. Uh, but I do think that the university has a central task in, in helping you to become wise, or if you're a teacher, to help your students to become wise. And I'd like to reflect a bit on uh, something that Steve Jobs has said about the importance of students to um, stay foolish, and what he could have meant by that. So, uh, first something about, uh, you, uh, about be, uh, the importance of being smart. Here you see a 21-year-old Indian student. His name is in the back, Ravier Mina. He has a Bachelor in Technology, and um, he broke one of the records in the Guinness Book uh, of Records. That is, he memorized 70,000 digits of the number pi. And he, rep re he reproduced them in nine hours and 27 minutes. So that means two digits every, every second. Well, this is quite an achievement. And if you assume that your long-term memory is part of, being, um, in, of part of being intelligent, then we can say that this is an incredibly smart guy. But is this the kind of people that we want the university to deliver? Is that the kind of people that we want the university to give to society? Um, so my question is, can you be smart yet foolish? And what can a university do to make you not only smart, but wise as well? 
So there are two sources that I'd like to con consult. Uh, the first is uh, philosophy. If I think about the history of philosophy, there's at least, there's surely one person that comes into mind. So imagine that you're walking around on this campus and there is this strange person who's walking barefoot, who hasn't washed himself or his clothes for at least two weeks, who's hairy, who's profoundly ugly, uh, who has bulging eyes, and who is asking you all kinds of penetrating questions about why you're living your life as you do. That's Socrates. So imagine someone like, like, like a homeless person. Imagine someone like him walking around here and doing stuff like that. That's what he did in the fifth century before Christ in Athens. Um, and he's considered to be, let's say, the, the, the mythical founding figure of the academic discipline of uh, philosophy and compared to Jesus and Buddha in terms of uh, his wisdom and uh, the ways in which people have tried to emulate him. So what he did is he went up to politicians, to craftsmen, to poets and asked them about anything that they claimed to know. Uh, things about uh, knowledge, about virtue, about piety, about moderation. Um, and um, everyone who he could persuade to talk with him ended up um, in some kind of crisis, uh, running away, being ashamed, because they couldn't tell what it was that they thought they knew something about. Now, interestingly, is why would Socrates do such a thing? So he's compared to a, um, a gadfly that stings people. That's in comparison that he makes uh, himself. Um, why would he do something like that? Well, actually, um, a friend of his went to the Oracle of Delphi, and this Oracle told his friend that Socrates was the wisest man in Athens. And Socrates, Socrates just couldn't believe it. He thought, well, this Oracle must make a mistake. So he had an idea to prove the Oracle wrong. So what he, went, what he did is he went up to all these influential and knowledgeable people and asked them questions about what they knew. Well, in the end, he had to conclude that the Oracle was right because nobody really knew what they were talking about, whereas Socrates at least knew that he knew nothing. So that, we could say, is one ingredient of being wise. That, ah, Socrates is in the room, or Aristotle, who, yeah, it's Socrates. Wow, what an honor that you're, you're, you're... <laughs> um, I don't know whether this is a coincidence, but I like it. Um, so Socrates, I've just been talking about you um, and about you being wise, and I think what we can learn from you as some kind of role model for us is uh, what you could call the, the, the humility theory of wisdom. So humility means that you know the limits of your knowledge and of your wisdom. And someone is wise, we can derive from Socrates, some Socrates, some kind of idea that you, um, that you recognize your fallibility, that you are um, um, uh, reflective, that you are introspective, and that you can deal with uncertainty. These kind of character traits or, um, can be associated with the kind of wisdom that uh, Socrates shows. Well, of course, Socrates is not the only one. I think it's a great example of, of, of wisdom, but the history of philosophy has much more to show. A second author I'd like to um, say a little bit more about is Aristotle, because he makes some great distinct distinctions between kinds of knowledge and kinds of wisdom. I won't discuss all these kinds of knowledge, um, but the kind of wisdom that I am talking about here when I'm talking about whether the university um, has a task and, and uh, in cultivating wisdom, I'm talking about practical wisdom. So I'm not talking about Sophia, a kind of philosophical wisdom, episteme, which is um, uh, universal knowledge, uh, you can compare that to the kind of scientific knowledge that's being developed here, the, the knowledge of mathemati mathematics, nous, um, intuitive understanding. I'm not talking about techna either, which is some kind of craft knowledge, but I'm talking about phronesis, or practical wisdom, or prudence. Maybe these words ring a bell. So what is practical wisdom? It's the knowledge... Um, about what is good or appropriate to do in the circumstances of everyday life. 
So it's the knowledge to know what is good or appropriate to do in the circumstances of everyday life. I'd just like to give you an example. And I think this example is uh, especially great for teachers, but for students as well, because they might realize how much practical wisdom teachers or university professors actually need. So imagine you're grading papers, and there are two papers from two students in particular, and you have a problem with it, because um, one student is struggling to get a C. Yeah, he's almost an, he has almost an, an insufficient mark for the, for the course. He has this decently um, written paper. It's, it's, it's well organized, it's okay, and there's, there are no major misunderstandings of the uh, key concepts. You could say it's a, buy, a B minus paper, uh, but it is by far the best paper that the student has ever written. Okay, that's paper one. Paper two, um, it's written by the smartest student in your class. Uh, the paper is well written, it's well organized, and it demonstrates fine comprehension. But it has no spark, it lacks originality. This, this student could have done much better. Okay, so the question is, what do you do? Do you, A, give grades that papers deserve in themselves? Do you, like A, give the grades uh, to the papers? Uh, or do you grade the papers just by looking at what the, the paper is worth? But you also encourage the C student to do better and admonish the A student that he could have done better. Or C, do you grade papers taking students' potential into account and saying, well, hey, uh, actually, I'm giving you a lower mark because you could have done better and this lacks a spark and that is something that you could have uh, done. So I would like you to discuss this uh, with your neighbor for two minutes. Good luck. Okay, uh, time is up. Um, I would like to hear some of your answers, but uh, there are some other things that I would like to hear your opinion about. So we'll do something like this uh, later. I think what I hope that you realize is can be pretty difficult because some kind of, the kind of questions Aristotle would say is that you have to ask in this, these kinds of situations is, for example, what is fair? Okay, that's one consideration. Another consideration might be, what is kind? What is a kind thing to do? A third, maybe, what is effective? A fourth, maybe, you know, what are the regulations, of the, you know, the, inst the institution that I work in? And then the final question is something, what matters most in the situation? And how do I balance these different values in this case? And that is what you need practical wisdom for to balance all kinds of different values in the situation and make a decision about uh, what it is that matters most in the situation and then actually act on that. So just this, just as an illustration of, of the kind of wisdom uh, uh, or the kind of knowledge that you need in order to make just, kind, effective decisions or act in such a way. Um, if I would have to summarize Aristotle's view on practical wisdom in three words, it would be this. Uh, wise is smart and good. Or put differently, um, 
Wisdom is knowing how to live well. So if you're only smart, um, you're, we don't know anything about how you implement this, this knowledge, knowledge that you have that can be put to use for very trivial matters or it can be used in an immoral way. So you could say if you're only smart, you're some, you can be some kind of ruthless nerd. Well, on the other hand, if you're only good but you're not smart, you might end up as some kind of um, naive idealist and not knowing anything about you know, the current state of affairs, uh, all kinds of facts, uh, reasoning well about how to achieve these ends well, etc., etc. So ideally, in a wise person, being smart and good are integrated. And uh, your intelligence, you use your intelligence to achieve good things, and your ideas about what's good are informed by your intelligence. And I'd like to give two small examples um, about what this could mean for you as a student. For example, my brother did a PhD in um, aerospace engineering at Delft University and worked for Shell, the company of Shell, for a couple of years. But then after a while, he realized that um, that was not what he wanted because he didn't believe in burning up all the fossil fuels that are left in the earth uh, contributing to global warming and he changed his mind and now he's back in academia doing research about wind energy. I don't want to say here that Shell is a bad company. That's not what I want to say. If you work for the, work for the com uh, companies like that, that you're a bad person. But that's being wise means making up your mind about how you want to use the knowledge that you have and whether the, pur whether the purpose that you use your knowledge for is good or not, that you at least think about these things. Another more famous example, you, know, you don't know my brother, but you do know this guy, Albert Einstein. His um, work had only about uh, E is MC square, had only a marginal role to play in nuclear scientific research. But what he did do is that he sent in 1939 a letter to President Roosevelt warning him that the Germans could develop a nuclear bomb pretty soon and asking him to take action. That's what he did. So my second question to you is, what would you do or what would you have done if you had been in a position like him? Would you warn the President of the United States that uh, the Germans could develop a uh, bomb like that, and actually that it would be better for the US to produce one first. Would you, do that? would you have done that or not? Again, two minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, time is up again. I don't want to say that one option is, is from some kind of objective point of view better than another, but what I do hope that you, what I do want to get across that it's important to think about these things, that it's not only becoming smart, but to think about what is good and, and, and why. So the, I think these examples, my brother and Albert Einstein, um, my brother wished that he was something like Albert Einstein, I suppose, um, are that, okay, developments in technology, I mean, that's one, and uh, that's great, but it's another to think about what kind of, 
how we should use technology, what kind of use of technology is wise and good. Well, these are the kinds of questions that practical wisdom can help us with. Now, the second source I wish to look at is psychology. I think psychology has made um, contributions to under better understanding uh, wisdom. Uh, there are different, different models of, uh, of, of wisdom. There's, for, for instance, the Berlin Wisdom Model. Uh, there's a model, Balance Model, by Sternberg, uh, by Monica Ardelt, an and, and American, uh, German-American psychologist, and a number of others. What I'd like to focus on here is um, the kind of research that psychologists have done into asking people, who do you think is wise and why? People from your personal life. And also, what do you think the concept of wisdom means? So we get something like a folk theory of wisdom. What do people actually acknowledge to be wise? What you get then is these four things. We could, we could summarize it in this way. That you have a deep understanding, and a deep understanding means that you know what matters in life. That you have an idea about what, is, uh, what, what personal and moral values people have. What kind of difficult um, uh, choices people have to make. Uh, for example, when I went on a uh, hike every now and then with a friend of mine, it's about five years ago, I didn't have any children of my own then, my friend was always late on, uh, uh, when, when we would catch the train to uh, a place like Groningen to, to walk the Pieterpad. Um, and um, he was always late, and we missed the train, and we could start only, I know, half an hour later. So I was quite angry with him, I remember that very well. I think, you know, looking back at it now, I think it wasn't very wise of me. I mean, it, 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 you know, because I didn't really put myself in, in myself in his shoes and think about you know what was what mattered to him and his life and he, you know that he had his two small children and his family and all this stuff during breakfast etc. Um, so um, it wasn't a very wise thing to do. I, I, I lacked deep understanding then of some kind of issues that matter to people like their children. Secondly, it's that you have some kind of reflective capaci capacities, that you don't only have deep understanding, but you also develop it over time, so that you experience things, that you learn from experience, that you think about it, that you take the advice from other wise people. Third, that you're not only wise, let's say, in your armchair, but you put it to practice. That is problem-solving activities, so that you actually act according to the wisdom that you have. Um, so, and you can judge what is at stake in a particular situation. And fourth, that you're motivated to, um, uh, to be wise, and not only for yourself, but that you also help others, that you give some kind of compassionate guidance to other people. So according to this folk theory, it's not only that you're, you are wise, that you, you can say about yourself that you're wise, but wisdom is also associated with helping other people to develop this kind of wisdom. Then, something I'll skip here. Um, oh no, I'll just, so we could sum this up and say something like um, the will and the skill to make good choices and help guide others to do so in virtue of a deep understanding of complex human problems. That could be some kind of overall definition of wisdom according to this folk theory. What I'm not going into now is how to measure virtue. Um, I think virtue can be measured and is measured, although the question is always uh, whether you do justice to a phenomena. But if this university would like to contribute to character, including intellectual character, and practical wisdom is one of them, I don't think they should shy away from measuring wisdom uh, and to at least look into these possibilities. Um, what I would, would like to focus on next is also something that um, psychology has contributed to, is an idea about the obstacles for becoming wise. So there are a number of fallacies. I think most of them are pretty familiar to most of us. Um, Sternberg talks about unrealistic uh, optimism. So people who are smart, he says, are more susceptible to being foolish because they think they're wise. Um, egocentrism, it's all about me, whereas wisdom has to do something with realizing a common good and thinking what is meaningful for other people as well. A sense of uh, omniscience, I know everything. You know, there's not that much to learn from other people or it's difficult, I don't want to be corrected by someone else. Um, omnipotence. 
I can do whatever I want. And sometimes combined with uh, a sense of invulnerability, I can get away with everything. Uh, then there is something like the sunk cost. So I've invested so much time and energy in it. I mean, the, the idea sucks, but I'll go ahead with it anyway. Uh, when you play poker, I think you all know <laughs> what this is like and you go all in because you think I've invested so much already. And uh, ethical disengagement. That is something like ethics is extremely important for other people, but not for me. So these are the kinds of fallacies from a psychological point of view that make it difficult or can make it difficult for smart people to become wise. At least uh, a way uh, 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 Sternberg tries to show that these are not the same and that intelligence doesn't alone save us, but we should be, um, um, uh, we should notice that these kinds of fallacies uh, are working on, uh, on us as well. So finally, that's the last chapter of the talk. Um, cultivating wisdom. Um, well, you can see there is a comma behind with age comes wisdom. Uh, Oscar Wilde didn't just say with age comes wisdom, but also uh, he added something to it that is, but sometimes age comes alone. So I think there is some kind of popular idea that, you know, the more gray or white hair you have, like uh, Gandalf the Gray, you know, you, you must be extremely wise. You know, as the older you get, the wiser you become. But I think we all know old people who are not wise, and I think we also know children, or at least young people, who are wise. So I think that doesn't, that's not true. So what is it then about age? Um, I think this, is, this idea by Oscar Wilde is also expressed by the uh, German-American uh, psychoanalyst Eric Erikson. He said, and I quote, wisdom is a likely but not inevitable byproduct of growing older. So it's not just about time. You know, you can sit in your room and sit and sit and sit and wait, but you will not get wiser. So what's necessary is not just time, but experience. Okay, but experience. Um, you might make the same mistake twice. So you're making a lot of mistakes along the way, but you make the same mistake over and over and over again. That's not really wise either. So it's not ab about experience, but it's about learning from experience. Then we can continue. About what kind of experience are, are you talking about? Well, this Monica Ardelt has argued that it's in particular about negative experiences. So it's not time, but experience. It's not just experience, but learning from experience. It's not just learning from any experience, but learning from negative experiences in particular. Um, trying to overcome experience, uh, these kind of negative experience, whether it's you lose your job or you become ill or whatever, um, uh, but trying to overcome them without despair of, or without becoming completely devastated. So she uh, says, and I quote, negative experiences can be the teachers that help you to develop wisdom. Okay, so what can the university do about this? I think if you focus on experience, then you understand that, let's say, um, um, uh, a separate module, a philosophy module for every student is not going to do the work. Okay, it might be an element because, for example, they can tell you about some wisdom traditions like, the, you know, I've just been talking about Socrates and Aristotle, but these kind of modules only give you some theoretical ideas, just as my talk is doing now, some theoretical ideas about, um, about wisdom. And being wise uh, includes more. Um, so these are the kinds of things that I would recommend uh, the university to do. There are only three, there are many more things to say, but because of limited time, I'll, I'll uh, emphasize these three. One is, is that you focus on the development of the whole person or uh, students' whole characters. Um, so wisdom is not simple or cannot be reduced to propositional knowledge. It's a kind of knowledge that you integrate in who you are that is related to uh, your values and your virtues, things like humility, tolerance, openness, and uh, compassion and care for other people. These are 
if we look at the philosophical tradition and the psychological traditions, these are elements that are associated with being wise. So if you're talking about wisdom, that means that you get the rest of someone's character as well, moral character traits like the, one, the ones that I've just mentioned. Second, um, I don't think that, um, I think that character and wisdom in particular, particular should first be caught and then taught. I don't say that it should only be caught and that it cannot be taught, but I think it should first be caught and then taught. What I mean is uh, the importance of having teachers who are role models with regards to wisdom. Um, so if you take wisdom seriously, you uh, invest in hiring people who are not only smart, but also wise and display their wisdom in uh, the classrooms. Um, and talking about wisdom and talking about character will definitely not do the work. So I can talk a lot about character and wisdom here, but if I do very foolish things out there, I don't see a reason why you would take me seriously. Um, that doesn't mean that um, observing role models and trying to emulate them in your own way is everything. I think y you could do much more to uh, try to develop wisdom in students. But it's, ne it's nevertheless a very fundamental thing. Thirdly, um, my suggestion would be is that you try to develop wise judgment in every module. Um, so there should always be room for discussion about questions like what kind of scholar or what kind of scientist do I want to be? Uh, do I want to be some kind of Albert Einstein? who, by the way, regretted later that he sent this letter to uh, President Roosevelt. Um, what is good about this idea that I have or this particular invention that I've uh, discovered? Um, how do I use the knowledge that I have for the good? And what is this good anyway? So I think these are the kind of questions that can be asked and should be asked in every module, whatever it is. And there are also some kind of things that work better than others in developing wisdom. For example, when you have to make a decision in some kind of life uh, affair, uh, what you could do is think about what a role model would do. That's one thing that has been proven um, uh, to work, that, you, that people make wiser decisions if they first think about what a role model would do. A second one is that you imagine yourself on a cloud traveling across, across the globe that you do that kind of exercise first. This kinds of, these kinds of exercises lead to wiser um, uh, judgments. And there are, of course, a number of, the, a number of the others uh, options that you could, uh, you could use. Finally, um, I promise to say something about um, Steve Jobs. Uh, I don't know, who, who knows this, um, this speech he gave at Stanford University in 2005? Okay, almost half. I think it was a very wise speech. It was a very wise, he had some very wise words. I mean, uh, talking about, uh, let's say, death and, and the importance that you really do things that you care about. Um, it was 10 years, I think, before he actually died, but still, it's a very wise speech. And so I didn't really understand why he you know, said at the end, you know, the famous words, uh, stay hungry, stay foolish. Why be foolish if you, you, you know, that he, why, while he was talking these wise words? Uh, it's worth looking at the, 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 the speech. You can find it online. Um, what he says, and I quote from, from his speech, is, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Okay, so if I take this seriously, you should stop you know, listening to me because you're, um, um, you know, this is just, these are the results of my thinking and of other people's thinking before me, but anyway. Um, so I think that he wanted to say that you should follow your heart and listen to your, your inner voice and don't have the courage to make mistakes and learn from, learn from them and try again and keep on trying and keep on trying. So I think um, I agree with him. I agree with what he said about this message that he wanted to get across these students. 
But I do, I, I disagree with that you would call that foolishness. I would rather call it wise. So I would prefer to say, stay hungry, stay foolish. And that's what I wish for you. Thank you.